Are kids eating the wrong foods and exercising too little in our public schools? Find out what a sugar-free school can teach us about the link between nutrition and success. And on our green tips, green baby diapers, next on Living Smart. Yvonne Sanders Butler grew up the sixth of eight children in a sharecropping family with little knowledge of healthy nutrition. Then in 1996, she nearly suffered a massive stroke, which she attributed to a lifetime of unhealthy eating habits. As a principal of an elementary school, she also saw the effects of poor nutrition in her students and began a school-wide campaign to create a sugar-free school in Georgia, the only one in the United States at the time, and soon saw drastic improvements in her students mentally as well as physically. She's the author of Healthy Kids and Smart Kids, and the founder and president of Inovi, an organization created to help ignite wellness and healthier lifestyles. She's here to discuss the impact of diet and exercise in academic performance. Welcome to Living Smart, Dr. Butler. Thank you for having me, Patty. It's good now, to be here. It seems that you had like a eureka moment when you were 39 and had this, this nearly massive stroke. What was it that was the wake-up call as far as it must be what I've been eating all my life? Well, basically, uh, I'm raised in the South. I'm uh, from Mississippi. I mm -hmm. am from a large family and grew up uh, basically eating a diet uh, that had high carbs and uh, lots of fat. Not because we didn't have vegetables, but that is what I liked. Right. And I enjoyed it. And so all of my life, I've been overweight or obese. And I was the only child out of eight and seven daughters. Wow. That was overweight or obese. And you thought you were addicted to sugars. I was addicted to sugar. And uh -huh. I believe now that that began as early as three years old. What do you know me. about sugar and addiction? Well, basically, I'm a sugar addict. And okay. I am addicted to sugar and carbohydrates. Not complex carbs, but a lot of the foods that we know today have a lot of uh, sugar and enhancers in it. And basically what it did for me, I was very distracted as a child and, you know, I couldn't stay on task and I moved around a lot. Today, I would have been diagnosed for having attention deficit disorder. They probably would have given me a drug for ADD even sure. though you were just addicted to sure. sugar. Sure. And you see that. We'll talk about that. Sure. Tell me about the Sugar Free Zone School, how it all started, because you had to convince the parents. Well, you had to convince a lot of people, but the parents primarily, the teachers and the students. How did you do it? Well, I think when you have a near-death experience like I had, uh, that's a major wake-up call. And it was for me because for the first time, I was told by a physician that fought to save my life that, Yvonne, there will not be a second chance for you. You're going to have to lose 50 to 60 pounds, and you're going to have to get some of the stress out of your life. And, and I was terrified. You know, I had been dieting for 24 years. Nothing worked. Nothing worked. Had probably lost over 500 pounds. Right. And as soon as the diet was over, I was back to my old habits. And right. so he was asking me to do something that I didn't think was possible. And so really, uh, I became angry. Mm -hmm. Because what I know today is that people think that, okay, people just overeat. They want to be overweight. Basically, it was so out of my control. Because if I started to eat sugar or a food that I like, I couldn't stop. And so this near-death experience, uh, it was what I needed mm -hmm. because I had a son that was 12 years old wow. and my husband was 39 and I wanted to see my son grow up and finish high school and spend more years with my husband. But I was really frightened that I couldn't do it and really uh, I had started to plan my own funeral and started to grieve because I knew that I couldn't do it. Okay. Here I am uh, with four educational degrees, and I'm in a doctoral program. And I tell people every day that I was ignorant, and my ignorance almost cost me my life. And so I had to become educated all over again about health and nutrition. And when I did, it was not rocket science because I actually entered a 12-step group. And I was angry because I said, here I am, middle class, uh, making a six-figure salary, and I have to go to talk to people 
about why I can't stop eating. And so I was able to accomplish those things uh, through research, uh, changing my behavior, learning to cook healthier, right. uh, fruit instead of something that came out of a bag that went crunch. And once I did that, um, I really made a promise to God. So you changed your life first before you yes. figured, I have got to do this sure. in my school. Sure. When you sat down with those parents, you were upset. Yes. But you knew how to get to them. What sure. did you say to them? Well, basically, uh, my school was in a very uh, upper middle class. Affluent, yeah. Affluent area. Mm -hmm. And it is in a community where you don't tell parents what to do. Right, they tell you. Parents tell you. Mm -hmm. But no one told me that when I came to the school. Right. What I saw was over a thousand children headed down the same path that I was on, except it had been accelerated to a treadmill level. And one day I was in the cafeteria and I watched a young boy overweight trade away a $600 baseball collection mm. for someone else's chocolate milk and fudge brownies. And I watched him when he did that and he didn't want to give it up, but he wanted to feed his addiction. And I saw myself at six and seven and uh, I left the cafeteria and went to my office and I, I said, oh my God, my kids. And something said to me, but you are the principal. So I decided it wasn't enough to ensure they had the best education. But if most of my children were in danger of dying before they were 20, 25 years old from the diseases that childhood obesity bring, mm -hmm. then I knew that I had been called to step out on faith right. and make a change. And so I went to these parents, called them in. I had done my research by now. And I knew over a decade ago, this program is over a decade old, that these would be the first generation of children that would die before their parents. And so when I met with the parents that afternoon and I shared with them about their test scores and how they compared with other schools and they weren't really all that phased by that. And I told them that I believe that the sluggish test scores had to do with children's diet and what they were eating and that a third of my children had slips on file from the physician that said they could be excused from PE. One third. One third. So for me, that was a cocktail for an early death. And so the parents looked at me and said, um, so what about the test scores and what are you going to do about them? And I said, well, first of all, it is going to be very difficult for me to do anything unless we change the diet of your children right. to be healthier, to change what they're eating for school lunches, what you're sending from home, right. and add P.E., and so, of course, uh, my PTA president was a graduate of Morehouse College, about 6'5", uh, 300, 300 pounds, and <laughs> right. very nice guy, but he had three sons there. I asked my parents that night, how many of you would leave a loaded weapon on your kitchen table without supervision or even in your home? I said, they looked at me, and they said, what did you say? I said, how many of you all would leave a loaded weapon in plain sight of your children? I said, because that is what you're doing. If a child picks up a loaded weapon, eventually they will pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. I said, and depending where the bullet enters the body, they won't have a second chance. 90% of them die. I said, so every day we do not look at creating a healthier culture for our kids at school and at home. Think about you left a loaded weapon. Right. You're feeding them. You're feeding them food. That's and, killing them. And they're drinking beverages at an alarming rate. The average child, instead of consuming from 12 to 1,500 calories for their age in an elementary school, 
they are consuming three times that amount. That's right. Their liver, their kidneys will not be able to hold up under this pressure. Mm -hmm. I am not going to be a part of this early death. And so you have a decision to make. I know that you love your children and that you would do anything to save their life. How quickly did they make the decision after you told them that? Within five minutes. They all signed a contract, right? You made them sign a contract. Well, they didn't sign a contract then. Okay. Because I wanted to make sure that I... They were on board. They were on board. Mm -hmm. Because I would have been fighting a losing battle. Right. So once the parents and the PTA decided that they would support me... They felt I was crazy, right? but they could support that. Okay. After that, then I assessed the, the environment to see exactly where we were, what we had, and what we needed to do. And as soon as I brought in the experts to help me do that, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a dietitian, a nutritionist, uh, I'm not a fitness expert, uh, I am aware of how the curriculum works, right. I established a leadership team, and I, as principal, of the school uh, was on that team along with the cafeteria manager, the fitness uh, coach, and all of the uh, chairs and student leaders in my school. And with that group, we reviewed all of the menus. We removed all of the processed, highly processed sugars, uh, fat, and sodium. And we made up a list for fresh fruit, vegetables. Most of our food came in cans. Uh, we were still frying at the time. Uh, whole milk and no fiber, really. And, and also you got rid of soft drinks and you have a story about that. The sugar soft drinks. It's yeah. amazing how many calories yeah. they have yeah. and how much they were drinking in your school yeah. too. So we did. We uh, looked at our machine, uh, but I didn't really understand that my whole school system had a huge contract well, uh, you live in Atlanta, Georgia, a big soda Atlanta. Pop company yeah. Uh, is yeah, established the capital. There. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, we know that. I won't say the name, but yeah, yeah. we won't say the name, but you know, I didn't really think about that. I just right. thought about saving my children. Right. And so as a part of assessing our environment and ensuring that we had the healthiest food and the uh, healthiest beverages for our children, then soda could not be a part of that. Just like no. ice cream and cupcakes. All out of there. Of, uh, out, out everything, of there. out. And so when they came to deliver the new and improved soda machines, uh, I was in the back of this building, okay? <laughs> it's over a hundred and some thousand feet. And the custodians called me and said, Dr. Butler, guess who's outside? And I said, who? They said, the Coke people. <laughs> I said, well, just tell them we're a sugar-free school and go away. <laughs> and they said, Dr. Butler, we told them that. They, they won't leave. So here I am running, <laughs> running. And I meet them at the door and they say, uh, we, we, we have to deliver these two machines. And I said, look, you know, we're a sugar-free school, the only one in the country. And, uh, you know, we don't have Coke anymore. And they said, lady, look, your school system is in a major contract. Uh, <laughs> we're going to deliver this. And I said, look, call your boss. I'm calling my superintendent you're not going to bring this in here. So it was 110 degrees, and they were the cutest, cutest guys. <laughs> they had their little shorts on, and they were all buff, and I said, God, uh -huh. you can tell when you're getting old. <laughs> and, you know, I'm raised in Mississippi, so I'm used to sun, and they were just sweating, soaked and wet. And their clothing was, it was sticking to them, you know, so I'm saying, nice. And so I, I said, look, I'm explaining to them why kids don't need Coke and your kidneys and whatever. And they said, ma'am, please. So one of the young men, cute, cute, he said, Dr. Butler, take the water. If you take the water, you'll still be in the contract. I said, why didn't you tell me that an hour That's and a easy. half ago? That's easy. And so I took the water. And after that, the healthier juices for the adults, mm -hmm. not for children. No juices for children because they have a lot of None. sugar. No matter what, None. they have a lot of sugar. None. 
tell me exactly what the diet is today in that school. Of course, you're not there anymore, yes. but, but tell me how you started the diet and what diet you still have in that school. Well, basically what we did, Patty, is that we wanted to remove highly processed foods. If they were high in sugar, uh, white flour, if they were foods that came in a can, as much frozen food as we could. So we wanted to ha children to have, you know, baked fish, baked uh, chicken. And if we did beef, we wanted it to be really lean. But mm -hmm. we basically did salads. They could have two and three vegetables. Now, today, they're advocating that. But in the elementary school, you only had one vegetables. You didn't have a choice of two vegetables right, and them. a salad. Uh, whole grain, you know, I was asking for whole grain and rye, and they said, you know, are you crazy or what? You know, I wanted organic cereal. I cut everything that had a sugar Component. base, frost, anything. That's it. Uh, people just went crazy. I took all of that out. So today, if you were coming to my school for breakfast, instead of you having syrup with three containers of syrup that your children made a little boat in their tray and they would float it, <laughs> then they would drink chocolate milk, and then they would be in my office like in 10 minutes. Nervous spinning, and upset. Spinning, <laughs> and they would have hit at least 10 people before they made it. Right. And so today, if you go, perhaps you will have whole wheat pancakes, but with fresh fruit. Right, right. And you can have a choice of milk, even soy. Mm -hmm. And you can have natural juice and from you USDA. You also have exercise every day for an hour. Every day. You start the day with exercise, correct? We start the day every morning with the entire school dancing. Okay, fantastic way to start. Great way. Let's talk about how quickly you saw the change in academic performance and also in health performance because I understand these kids stopped taking so many drugs. Yes, yes. The first semester we saw the first sign of academics, our first norm testing, state testing. But really, 60 to 90 days, we start seeing behavior change within children. After the first week, the kids came to school, we had no chocolate milk, and they said, well, where's the chocolate milk? Where's the cake? You know, what are we going to do about birthday parties? As soon as it wasn't there, they were okay. It only takes 28 days to change, to change your taste buds and it's change like 21 habits. 21 or 28, yeah. Yes. Yeah, sometimes you're stubborn like I was. It might be 30, <laughs> you know, and then you finally get it. Yeah. And so really within the first 30 to 60 days, children that I saw repeatedly in the office for behavior concerns, they stopped coming. And teachers start telling me, Dr. Butler, you won't believe these students are on task, they're focused, they come, they're ready to do their work because we reworked our curriculum as well. When you think of a kindergartner that's five years old, that's in class and you want them to sit down for 30 minutes, they have five minutes of attention span. Right. So we ensured that 15 minutes to 30 minutes that kids were able to get up, they were able to move around and we saw with benchmark testing that the math and the reading scores were going up and I'm saying this is a fluke um, this is just by accident and then we started looking at the data because we were looking at nursing referrals we were looking at discipline referrals and we saw 30 percent of the counseling referrals drop and we saw 23 that is huge of discipline referrals drop and after the first semester, we did our state tests and our other standardized tests, and we saw a 15% gain in reading alone. And you are now in how many schools around the country? Well, we're actually in 22 schools 22 in school Georgia. In Georgia. In Georgia. Is your program, are people looking into your program to take it yes. national? Yes. How close are you to going national with this concept, with this idea? How hard is it for you to convince people that this is what needs to be done? Well, first of all, I've uh, been very fortunate. I've been around for a decade. Uh, Brown's Mill has had a Healthy Kids, Smart Kids program with a sugar-free zone. The beauty of a program like this, when I first came to the school, we were 23% free and reduced lunch. The school is now 67%. 
that's, that normally means that the kids are not going to do as well academically. Mm -hmm. We have done just the opposite. Over the last uh, five years, we have been a National Blue Ribbon School. Mm -hmm. We have also been a Georgia School of Excellence, 2005, 2008. We've also suffered the same economic woes as everyone else. But we've now fostered an environment and a climate. It has spilled into the community. And we've been fortunate because we've had people like the National Institute of Health uh, to come to us and the Institute of Medicine. And we've actually had our first um, case study published on Brown's Mill. And uh, I'm very thankful uh, to NIH for that. Uh, and seeing that this program has merit, we know that we can replicate this program. We know that it's sustainable because we are now in 19 other schools. And we have K through 12. This program is in its second year. It's impacted over 20,000 students. And their scores are basically higher than other schools. If I'm a parent watching the show and I live in another state sure. and I say, I want this program in my school, yes. what's the steps I need to take? Well, first of all, I would go to my local school. Mm -hmm. School Be board? I would go to my local school first and talk to the principal. I know I'm a principal, and we want the best for our children as parents do. There are 55 million school-aged children. What people don't understand is that principals have a lot of clout. We have the ability to make change in a school, in a community, and people trust the school. Mm -hmm. What I know and what people are hearing now, that in 2004, every public school was supposed to implement a wellness policy. Well, it didn't go off so well. And so what I can tell you, when we received that as principals, I knew it because I'd actually already done it. But there was no guidance. There wasn't anything. Now parents are being asked to be a part of, of the, the wellness, process, yeah. mm -hmm, of the process. Principals would love for parents to come in and to support that effort. I would tell a parent today, go to your school principal and ask to be on a committee to see how you can support them in getting this program into your school. Because, you see, if a principal buys into this model and they champion that model, it is going to do exactly what happened at Brown's Mill. Except now, I, lear I learn by doing. And that has already been done for them. And the principal, as the head and as the leader, we have 55 million children, a captive audience, you do, you do. For 8 to 14 hours a day. How do you know you're living smart? Well, before this near-death experience, I was always strung out on edge. You know, moving by the speed of sound, eating when I could, eating at night, working too many hours. Um, fitness, it was nice. I have a lot of tapes, a lot of books that I've never used. But today, you know when you're living smart, when you have balance in your life. Thank you so much for joining us and for the work that you've done. Thank, Thank you. you. And now on our green tips, Tammy Nelson shares the different types of green baby diapers. Green baby diapers come in a variety of shapes and forms. When most people think of eco-friendly diapering, they think of your mom's cloth diaper or your grandma's cloth diaper. That's not what it's like anymore. This is an example of a reusable cloth diaper. It's reusable, washable at home. This is also a cloth diaper. This is a cloth diaper with an insert that's flushable. And this is a 100% biodegradable disposable diaper. Fabrics are much smarter now than they used to be. This diaper, for example, has micro terry inserts that wick moisture away. All of our diapers have a fabric called PUL, which is polyurethane laminate, that makes all of our diapers waterproof. There's no need for rubber pants anymore. Some diapers have organic cotton soaker pads, like this. It's up to the parent's preference what they would like to use. 
man-made fibers or organic fibers. The diapering alternatives we offer to parents are eco-friendly in a number of ways. Um, the U.S. consumer deposits 18 billion diapers in U.S. landfills every year. It generates one ton of household garbage per child, per house, and it is the third largest consumer item in our landfills, and they never go away. These diapers don't contribute to that at all. To learn more about green tips or sugar-free schools, go to our website. There you'll find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a joyful week. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.